This morning, I want to share just a simple lesson, yet a profound lesson from one of my favorite stories, if not my absolute favorite story in the whole Bible. It's a story that I've prayed much over, that has become very dear to my heart. It's a story that God often brings to my mind, especially when I struggle with trusting in Him. And that story is a story that I'm sure all of you know. It's found in Matthew chapter 8. You know, Jesus, he often healed many um, Jews, right, who were like sick, who were blind, who were lame. But you know, Jesus often, he other times healed those whom the Jews considered unclean, whom the Jews considered as Gentiles. And you know, there was a man, he was a centurion, and he had heard many stories of when Jesus had healed people. And one of his servants became desperately, like severely ill. And this really broke the heart of the centurion. Why? Because his servant was a very obedient, faithful servant. He was of great value to the centurion, and the centurion did not want to suffer the loss of losing his servant. And so he thought, if Jesus healed all these other people, I want to see if Jesus can heal my servant too. I am going to go to Jesus. And so he came to Jesus and he pleaded with Jesus to heal his servant. And I think these are some of the most beautiful words that Jesus said. He said, verse, um, verse 5? No. Sorry here. Let me get my notes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, verse 7. He said, I will come and what? Heal him. Jesus had so much compassion for this man. You know, I love it that Jesus, he didn't just care about the Jews, he cared about everyone. And, you know, I have never really thought about this before, but here, you know, the disciples, I'm sure the disciples were right there. And here they witnessed Jesus ministering to someone who was considered an outcast by the Jewish nation, someone who was considered unclean. The love of Jesus is amazing, isn't it? He said, I will come and heal him. But the centurion, he didn't feel worthy of Jesus coming to his house. And so he said, Lord, it would be enough. Just speak the word only, and, your, and the servant will be healed. Just speak the word only. That is sufficient for me. Just speak. The, the faith of the centurion often speaks to my heart. Friends, do we have, are we like the Jews whose faith was so shallow? They had so much at their fingertips, so much knowledge. They had the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. They knew so much, yet their faith was so weak in Jesus as the nation of a whole. <laughs> there were some who did really believe in Jesus' power. But here is this man, in simple yet sincere faith. He says, it's just sufficient for you to speak your word. I believe that when you speak it, that is enough. Your word will come true. And what, did, what happened? Was his servant healed? Amen. That servant was healed. And Jesus, he said to those around, I have not seen so great faith in Israel before. In Isaiah 55, 11, God says that his word will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish what he pleases. Friends, God's word is living and sure. Man's word may fail us, but God's word will not fail us. We can trust that whatever Jesus says, that is truth and it will come to pass. We as the centurion must say, Lord, it's enough what you have said. I don't have to see it to believe it. I believe it because you have said it. I know with me, there's often times, especially in difficult times, it's hard to trust the Lord, right? It's hard to take his promises for what it says. But friends, my prayer is that for each one of us, whether it's in easy times or difficult times, we will take his promises for what they say. He says, 
that we can do all things through him because he gives us strength. When we are weak, we are strong through him. Friends, let's remember that God's word is living and that we can trust his every word just in simple faith, just like the centurion. I pray that today we will consider this lesson carefully and our faith will grow. Now Mr. Reed will have the mission report. Good morning. I was asked to do a mission report on uh, personal experience. And so a mission report this morning comes to us all the way from New York. Now, sometime this year, my family and I were praying earnestly for God to guide us as to what to do for the summer. So after much prayer, we felt that God was saying, go canvassing. But how and where? How do you go canvassing with a family of four, two small kids? So we tried different, uh, different uh, avenues. And one day, a friend of mine from New York called and said, can you come over and help us with the New York Conference Youth Challenge? Now, they were trying to start a youth challenge or a new canvassing program in upstate New York Conference. Now, there's a problem with that. Number one, I'm not a youth. <laughs> well, I'm still young. And it's very challenging. Now, I canvassed before, so, um, so I was excited, but I was not excited. Because you're going out to do youth challenge, okay? So anyway, we decided if the Lord says go, we're going. Now, we remember that we would have our kids listen to a series called The Pathway of the Pioneers. And as we listened to those stories, we heard of uh, experiences of the Adventist pioneers, how they had long, hard journeys. They would travel in snow. They would travel in rain. At one point, Ellen White was traveling on a sleigh over fragile ice to deliver a message. And as we compared the sacrifice of the pioneers to our life, we thought, ah, uh, we're having it really easy. So off we went to New York in our sleigh. So as we, when, we, when we arrived, the first day of canvassing, uh, I was in Corning, New York, city of Corning. And I was knocking on doors, and I met a lady who is an accountant, and she works from home because her husband has at least four different ailments. He's very sick. And so she works from home. She spends an hour each day with God before doing anything else, and her favorite devotional book is from the 1800s. So... <laughs> We had a good conversation. We connected, spiritually and socially connected. And she got health books. And I think she got a spiritual book. Uh, I'm not sure. But it wasn't a great controversy. So the conversation ended with prayer, with much prayer. We spent much time together. And so off I went to, to meet with uh, the other uh, teammates. And I was sharing with them my experience, and one of them suggested, hey, I have a, I shared them my desire to go back to her, an impression to go back to her and to give her the great controversy, so, or another book. So one of my friends says, well, I have a free great controversy here. Why don't you go back and give it to her? I said, ah, you know when you're canvassing and you spend so much time with someone, you don't want to go back because they're so busy and she, she has a husband to care for. So I prayed. I went back to the house, and I was saying, Lord, please don't let me and this lady become annoyed, and please let her not be offended by me coming again. And I was praying, so I went to her door, uh, ring the bell, rang the bell. Out she came saying, I'm so happy that you returned. 
Well, what happened before is I offered her my number. There was that connection, and I offered her my number because I felt that God was saying, take her, give her your number so she can connect with you, because we were talking about some, some health issues and so forth. So she was hesitant and she was busy, so she didn't take my number. So when I returned, I said, I, I rang her bell, and she said, she said, I'm so happy you returned because I was just, I was just thinking that I needed your number, but I couldn't leave my dog, so I was just thinking of grabbing my dog and coming after you. <laughs> so I said, wow, this is a divine appointment. This is a divine appointment. Well, I have this book for you from the 1800s, and I felt that God wanted me to share this with you, and we connected again, prayed again, and she has not called me yet, but not Elizabeth. Elizabeth is an old lady that I met on the street. Uh, we were cam I was canvassing in the city, and I was confused. Lord, where do I go? Who do I talk to? Because all the businesses were already done. So the Lord says, okay, cross, go across the street. And I was at the stoplight. Right in front of me was this old lady. She had a cigarette in her hand, and she, she, she really smoked. And so I, I began to strike up a conversation with her. And to cut a long story short, after we crossed the street, she stopped. I stopped. We were talking. She was telling me more about her life and opening up and sharing some of the hurts and pains that she was going through. She gave me her information, signed up for Bible study, for coming to church, for prayer, and, uh, and we connected. There was this connection, this connection with, with, with us, this heart connection. And she called me about two weeks ago, and I referred her to one of the pastors. And it struck me this morning, as, as I close this mission story, that why did I go so far? I mean, I could, I could just stay in, in, you know, in Arkansas. Well, most of my family are in New York and New Jersey anyway, and we spend time with family. But it struck me this morning, always said to me, imagine that Christ came from so far, made such a great sacrifice to save humanity. What if he referred these individuals to us and we did nothing? How would he feel? After making such a connection with humanity and then pass these individuals over to us and we did nothing. And my heart was humble this morning that we need to, we need to, we need to help others. And Jesus hurts when we don't because of what he did to reach them. And so, to God be the glory, I'm still learning and still uh, being a missionary as Mr. Jem has been teaching us. May God bless us as we uh, enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Our mission, our mission offer this morning, may, uh, I'm going to invite the deacons to come forward and to collect the mission offering.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering. We pray that it will go to the ends of the world to bring souls to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for giving your life so that we can be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now divide for our Sabbath school class, classes, the, oh, there's special music. We'll now have special music by Kevin Gomez. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's a privilege for me to sing for, for the Lord and for you guys as well. I first heard this song in Spanish, it's called El Clamor Final, and it's titled At the Midnight Cry in English, but for theology sakes we will call it At the Final Cry. This is the name of the song, At the Final Cry.
when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air, and those who church family. Glad you're all here today. One thing I love about the Sabbath is that all of our burdens throughout the week can be laid down Friday night when that sun goes down. We don't have to worry about any work that we have to do. We don't have to worry about any problems that we have. All we have to do is spend time with Jesus. And I'm so grateful for that. All the burdens are just lifted off to me today. I had a pretty pretty tough week, but it doesn't matter now because I'm spending my time with the Lord today. Before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we get to spend with you and to learn more about you and your second coming. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will be here with us now As we learn, Lord, please lead and guide us and direct our thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you will inspire us to speak words that will edify each other, Lord, today. We love you and we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the memory verse for this week. Does anyone have it memorized? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. It's one of my favorites. It keeps me, uh, what's the word? It helps me to know that what I'm doing here in this world is not for nothing. And it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, sometimes I ask myself, am I making a difference in this world? And what I'm, am I doing anything good for the Lord? And this verse says, yes, you are. The Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes. We may not be able to see the results of our labor, but keep working for the Lord anyway. He is doing more than you, than you can know. So this lesson this week is about living the Advent hope. And uh, let's see here. Uh, do we have any roaming mics? I'm going to ask you guys a question. What is our hope? Why are we Seventh-day Adventists? What are we looking forward to? Would anyone like to comment on that? Mrs., uh, I mean, Dr. Kathy over here. If we can get a mic over to her, Dr. Kathy. Black mic. Hello? There. Okay. We are looking forward to Jesus uniting us with him for eternity. That's, that's it, to be with our Savior. That's right. And how does that hope affect our lives today? How does that affect the way we live now? Anyone else like to answer that? We want other 
encouraged to be joining us. And this is this is too good to keep to ourselves. Yes, we want everyone. We want to bring as many people to the kingdom of God as we possibly can. Because uh, yes, April. Oh, if you could pass it, April. Um, visited anyone who does not know the blessed hope that we have. Um, I went to Africa, spent 11 years there, and it's very evident. Uh, I went to visit the Pygmy tribe especially, and they didn't even know who Jesus was. They didn't know what a Christian was. And to just see that, it affected their whole life. Their faces were very sad. The way they lived, there was nothing for them. There was nothing for tomorrow. And we as Christians, we as Seventh-day Adventists, have this blessed hope, and so it should affect our whole life. We should, people should be able to look at us and see that we have something different. We have a hope um, just by looking at our faces. You know, a lot of us grew up with this hope, and we don't know what it's like to not have this hope. And it could be taken for granted. Just imagine if you didn't have something you could look forward to. All you had was these bleak surroundings, you were just sorrow, you didn't know how you were ever going to be happy in the future. Life would just be terrible, but we have this hope, and we, we need to share this hope about the love of Jesus with the rest of the world. And throughout eternity, just saving one soul, you will never know how valuable one soul is until you get into eternity. One soul is just so valuable. Je the one soul is worth to Jesus, the life of God. You can just think about that one soul. And, uh, you know, in Sunday's lesson, it talks about these precious souls here on the earth. They are asking, how long, O oh Lord? How long are we going to suffer here on this earth? How long? I'm going to read uh, the third paragraph in a, let me see. On Sunday's lesson. Actually, no, I'm going to read the fourth one. It says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, Violence, but you do not save? Uh, skipping down in Revelation 16, verse, or 6, verse 10. This cry, How long, O Lord, is taken up on behalf of those who have been martyred for their faith in God? But it is the same cry, calling on God to intervene on behalf of his oppressed and persecuted people. You know, there's so many people in the world who are just suffering right now. Here on Watchdog Hills Academy College, the campus here is beautiful here. We have everything we need. We got food, we got friends, we have good Christian fellowship, and we are not suffering the way a lot of people out there are suffering. You can think about the persecuted Christians in China. They're being imprisoned and tortured for their faith right now on this same planet that we're living on. And they're crying out, how long, O oh Lord? How long? And, uh, you know, there's a parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 8, that we're going to go to. And uh, it's about a widow who is suffering, and she wants to get justice from the unjust judge. And we're going to read that. Do we have anyone with a nice, enthusiastic voice to read Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8? Brother Armand, thank you very much. Yes, sir. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. This is New Living Translation, by the way. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him all day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? So it seems here... Okay, so this judge, it takes a while for him to answer the prayer, or to, to give this widow justice. 
And Jesus is comparing this unjust judge to God the Father. Uh, we're going to read the question on the bottom of page 89. What is Jesus saying about God's response to the repeated cries and prayers of his people for him to act on their behalf? What is Jesus saying about God's response for the repeated cries and prayers of his people? Would anyone like to take a stab at that? Okay, Mark Candy. So, when we look at when we look at this uh, account, really you're seeing a contrast between the character of the unjust judge and that of the father. Um, the widow was repeatedly and perseveringly request, making a request to the unjust judge. And Christ responds and says, you know, would not the father likewise do the same? And so the unjust judge doesn't care about man or God, but God, he loves us and he cares for us. And in the same way that the unjust judge was willing to honor the request of the woman, God himself is very enthusiastically, eagerly awaiting for us to just ask, and he's ready to give to us, but we have to have that faith and we have to persevere in our prayer. Persevering prayer. That is the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. You know, I, I like that question that Jesus asked at the very end of this parable. It says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This is a really good question. Do you think that when Jesus comes back that he's going to find this kind of faith on the earth? In other words, are you persistently, perseveringly praying for that thing that you have been praying for? Are you going to continue praying until you get that thing that you've been praying for? Are you going to be like Jacob, who was wrestling with the angel of God and saying, Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. I need you. I need this thing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop until I get what I'm looking for. And you know, Jacob was praying for his family not to be killed by his brother Esau. He was pretty much praying for the salvation of his family. I know a lot of us have family who we are praying for. And you know, we're not seeing the results of our prayers day after day. We think, is God even hearing our prayer? We're, we're praying for the salvation of our loved family. Are we going to continue praying day after day, year after year? Will God find this kind of faith in you when he comes back to the earth? I hope so. I know I need to grow in this myself. Uh, and I want to ask you guys a question. If there's someone who is suffering on this earth, how could you comfort them? They've been praying for years for something. How could you comfort them? What would you say to someone who is suffering? They've been praying for so long. Lord, I need this from you. Lord, deliver me from my adversary. What could you say to comfort them? Brother Armand. I was reading the, in the book of Job the other day, and when he was going through what he was going through, his friends sat in silence with him for a week and didn't say a word. So I think just the company alone could be a greater blessing than actually opening your mouth, because um, you, you, eventually they ended up saying the wrong thing, and they made bad matters worse. So I think just the presence of somebody when you're going through a state of grief is a huge blessing. That is true, yes. So there's a story of this man in this third world country, and he's sitting, and you know there's a banana plantation by where he's at, and he sees all these monkeys go into the banana plantation. You know they eat all the fruits in there, and they come out, and you know you see them running, and they're orderly and formal, and they're going into the tree line because he sees a dog; it's chasing after them. And so there's this one monkey lagging behind all the other monkeys. And, you know, it probably had too much bananas to eat or whatever. And because it's lagging behind, all the other monkeys make it up into the tree. But this one gets bit by the dog. And this man watching this, he thinks, oh, no, I'm about to witness a monkey get mauled by a dog. But then instead of all those monkeys sitting up in the tree, pointing out that other monkey and said, ah, oh, see, you shouldn't have been gluttonous, you shouldn't have been this or that. They come down out of their tree and they go help that other monkey. I bring up this story because oftentimes 
we're really good at finding the fault with people and telling them why it is they're in the situation that they are. But honestly, they probably know why they're in the situation. We need to be there for them and be friends with them. And yeah, instead of, you know, Job's friends sitting there and, you know, telling them every reason like, oh, you must have committed iniquity or this, that, and the other, we should actually just be there to be friends. Indeed. You know, I've uh, seen a lot of people who have been suffering, and they say, I don't know what to do. I can't handle this. And there's always two Bible verses that just come up to my mind. And I, I share these every time someone's suffering. And one of them is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You know, what we're going through right now is nothing compared to what is coming. And when we remember that, oh, it's, it, it helps lighten the load. Did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, right here. Okay, Josh, first, and then you. Hello? Okay, I don't know. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, one thing I um, really think from my own personal experience is really a lot of times, a lot of times we just need to shut up and just let God talk, you know, like, to be honest. Like, we, our wisdom, like we've learned this week, is so, so, uh, God's ways are so much higher than our ways, and we may give good advice, and we may sympathize with them, but a lot of times we don't actually feel, we can't relate with them fully, and only God knows that, um, each of us, perfectly. And I believe, honestly, for the best, the best advice that, in any situation, if someone's struggling with anything, I think the best situation is to point them to Jesus, because they're only going to get peace from there anyway. Um, as much as you can say it may never comfort them fully, only God can really fill that hole in their heart. That is true, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I was just going to add on to what everyone has been saying. Practically, like, let's say somebody, uh, a family member dies. Um, first, yeah, you really sh can't say anything, even if you know how it feels, like, yeah, like Josh said, sometimes you just got to be quiet. Um, but a verse comes to my mind, uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he, for the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with thee, and he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And you could tell somebody this, but I also think of the verse, carry each other's burdens. So practically speaking, like if somebody's um, family member dies, you really want to carry their burden as, it, as if it's your own. And when a situation like that comes about, you want to try to deviate their mind from the situation, not like make them forget and like, you know, and come back to it later, but you want their heart to be filled with joy. So practically speaking, you'd probably want to help them or take them out to dinner or something that their mind can be able to reason with the situation and, you know, conversate with them. Just try to get their mind off of what is on right now or, and sympathize with them at the same time. So, you know, like um, Jay said, be friends. Indeed. And, you know, I love when people share with me scriptures when I'm going through a hard time because, you know, that is the thing. That's the only thing that really gives me confidence and courage for the future. That's the only thing that really helps me. And uh, one more scripture I want to share with you is uh, Romans 8, verse 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, this, the suffering that we have to go through here on earth, it seems hard to bear sometimes. But by God's grace, we can bear it. And it's going to be so, once we get to heaven, we're not even going to be able to remember these things. It's, you know, my little brother told me one time, this life is like a rope. You know, eternity is like a rope that goes on forever. And our life right now is just one tiny little fiber in one tiny little section of this rope. It's so insignificant the pain that we go through here compared to what will be revealed in us afterwards. Yes, Mboshe. Orange mic. 
I know with grief, um, it's, it's very, especially with each person, every single person is different when they've lost somebody. I think something that would help as well is a lot of times when people are going through tough things, that is when everybody flocks towards that person to show them sympathy and kindness and compassion, and which is good, it's a blessing. But oftentimes it might be hard for that person to really appreciate it because that may be the only time that those people have shown them that type of love. And if we can develop the habit now when things are good to show that type of sympathy and compassion with people, when they do go through a tough time, they will be more willing to say, you know what, I have a family here that really does care about me. Because I can only imagine if people are coming to me and trying to you know, comfort me if I'm going through something, in my mind I might be thinking, you know, these people, I see that they care, but we don't really have a relationship like that. And I can imagine when Mary and Martha, when they went through what they went through, they knew that Jesus already had a compassion for them. So they were able to listen to him even if he did say something to them while they were going through a tough time. So develop, developing the habit to look for opportunities to show that type of love to everybody. And of course it's hard because we can't minister, not one person can minister to every single person. But if every single one of us do our part, we can foster an environment of compassion and sympathy before a tough time comes. That way it's a little easier on the person. We are going to turn over to Monday's lesson now. And I'm going to read a little bit of the first sentence and uh, the second paragraph. And it says, religion has often been criticized for a tendency to draw believers away from life here and now toward some better afterlife. Paragraph two. And two, we have terrible examples of those in power telling the poor and oppressed just to accept their sad lot now. Because when Jesus returns, all will be made right. So what this paragraph is pretty much saying is that because we have this blessed hope for the future, sometimes Christians, they, they just, instead of helping them here and now, they say, oh, just look towards, look towards the future. You're going to go to heaven one day soon. And that is good. And we should do that. But at the same time, we should also help them in whatever we, way we can here and now. And we're going to read... Uh, sections of Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew 25 and uh, I'm going to divide sections for you guys to read and I'm going to give you th three or four minutes to read them and then uh, we're going to have you summarize what you read and then you're going to give us the most important points about what Jesus said so you this section over here I would like you to read Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 14, on your own. You can read it silently. This section right here on this side of the camera, I would like you to read Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. This section here on the other side of this camera, I would like you to read Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. This section over here, I would like you to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, verses 14 through 29. I'd like you to read it silently, and then we're going to discuss what each section has read. So go ahead. I'm going to give you guys three minutes to read those 15 verses. Come again. Your verse is Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 29. Does everyone know which verses they're reading? Okay, go for it. You got three minutes.
We got one minute left. Okay, let's uh, get back together here. Group number one, can you summarize what you read? And then after that, tell us the most important part of what Jesus said in that chapter to you. Do we have a volunteer for this section right here? Any volunteers? Mrs. Glass, thank you very much. Let's hear a summary first. Blue mic. The most important part that I see here is um, it says, don't be troubled and don't be deceived and stay connected to the source of love because love will grow cold in many people. And don't give up, but keep preaching the gospel and Jesus will come. Can I have another one? Tell me, what, what was the most important thing to you that Jesus said there in that section? Do we have a volunteer? I'm going to pick a volunteer if someone doesn't raise their hand. All right, Judith, thank you very much. We were talking with my dad. Blue mic? Yeah, we were talking with my dad, and um, one thing that caught our attention was that the love of many shall wax cold. Um, and then the next verse, it talks about, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Um, and, and just going a little bit back to the question that you asked of, what do you say to someone that is in, in suffering or is in pain? And we see that in Second um, 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about the love, the love that bears all, the love that is patient the love that will teach you how to speak a word in due season. And we see that many times, even within the church, the love of many is waxing cold. And that the only way that we can have that love is if we abide in Christ. And so that is why it's so important that we endure to the end, that we keep holding on, that you don't, that you don't give up. And so I'm... Um, and it's interesting that we go through all these, you know, it talks about these famines and pestilence, but then it says, but hold on, keep going, because the message needs to be preached. So that is our goal, that we ourselves may hold on to Christ, because through that, other people can be saved. So that's what we said. Amen. Never, ever let go of Jesus. One thing I really appreciated about this chapter, it says, you know, there's going to be wars, there's going to be famines, there's going to be pestilences. But he says, don't be afraid. All these things must come to pass before I come back. Don't be afraid. It's going to happen. I told you beforehand so that you know it's going to happen. So when it does happen, don't be afraid. That's one thing I love about that, that verse. Okay, section number two. You read Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. We're going to have Dr. Clark first and then Dr. Um, uh, Kathy. We have a summary first. <clears throat> yes, it appears that um, there, are cho there are rewards for whatever choice we make. We're counseled to be faithful, faithful servants. And <clears throat> if we're unfaithful, there's rewards there too. But uh, the most important thing is in verse 40, uh, 46. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing, shall find faithful. So we can either choose 
unfaithfulness and be cut asunder and appointed a portion with the hypocrites, which is eternal death, or we can be faithful and uh, the Lord will make us ruler over his goods. And the summary, or what the most important thing is, let's be faithful and happy. Dr. Kathy. This goes with it. There are two verses that are basically the same and adding emphasis. Verse 42 says, watch therefore, for you know not the hour your Lord doth come. And then verse 44 says, therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So the advice there to watch, to be ready, that's, that's the difference between life and death for us and be, between uh, receiving this hope that we're waiting for or losing it forever. You know, it seems like it's been a long time. We're still waiting for Jesus after all these years. It's been, what, 150 years since 1844? Where is Jesus? But he still says, I'm coming at an hour that you are not going to expect, so be ready. Be ready. There's no, there's no time to lose. We have to spend every moment possible getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. It's, it's the most important thing in the world. So be ready. Group number three. You read Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Brother Mark Candy, will you give us a, um, a short summary and what you think is most important in that chapter? Hello. Yeah, so it's uh, the parable of the ten virgins, and all ten were asleep. All ten were virgins. All ten had the lamp, but not all of them were ready when Christ came. And... Um, for me, what I thought was the most important part is this. They had the lamp, and the Bible tells us, you know, his word is a lamp. And also, as well, they were virgins, which means they were pure. They had right teachings and right doctrines, and they had their Bible. But in verse 12, it says this. Um, but he answered and said, verily, I say, it, I say unto you, I know you not. So they knew the right teachings. They had the word of God. They were in the right church, but they didn't know Jesus Christ. And so, to me, the most important thing is to know Jesus Christ. This is life eternal, to know him. That's right. Would anyone like to add to that? One thing I thought was really important about this was, okay, what does the, whole, what does the oil represent in this parable? The Holy Spirit. One thing that Jesus said really stood out to me, it's in a... Luke 6, 63, it says that my, he said, my words are spirit and they are life. God's word is his spirit and it's his, it's his life. Do we have his, his words treasured up in our vessels? If we did not have our Bibles, would we be able to explain why we believe in what we believe in? Yes, Chris Miller. Something that stood out to me in the, in the story there is the fact that all of them had oil at a certain time. But the foolish ones didn't take extra oil. And then it says in verse, verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And in my mind, I'm thinking that the people that didn't get more oil, they probably thought that what they had would last them. They didn't know that it was going to take longer than expected. And the bridegroom tarried. And so they felt like they had enough. They had enough to last them for what they needed, but they didn't. And um, it made me think... Sometimes I feel like I have enough right now for, for what's coming. And um, I was reading in Desire of Ages, and it talked about Jesus praying fervently and praying all night. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't, I don't do that often. I don't pray all night, and I don't pray with crying and strong tears. I don't know a lot of people that pray regularly crying with strong tears. And I'm, I, I had this thought to myself. I was like, well, why would I need to pray like that? And... Um, that kind of shocked me because I was thinking, if my life was in danger, I'd pray with crying and strong tears. If, if something really, really bad was happening, we would pray all night. And the reason that I don't pray like that now is because I don't feel like I need it right now. Because I felt like I have enough. Like the way I pray now is enough for right now. And um, I feel like that's really dangerous because that's how the foolish virgins felt. Like what they had was enough. There was no danger. There was no threat, and they were okay where they were. 
You know, that reminds me of something that happened to me when I was a kid. I was like 15. My youth pastor planned for us to go on this crazy hike in the Sequoia National Park. It was like a five-day hike. We were going to hike 12 miles a day with 30 or 50-pound backpacks on our, on our back. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get ready for this hike. So then when it comes, I'm just going to rip right through it. No problem. And you know what I did to prepare for it? I took one little five-mile walk home from church one day, and it was over a hill. I did that once, okay? And by the time we took that serious hike, I was dying on the first leg of the journey. I was like, man, this is crazy. I can't believe I agreed to do this. This is not fun at all. And I, I was thinking, you know, I should have prepared so much more. What was I thinking? Just one little five-mile walk was going to whip me in shape for this hike? <laughs> no way. And that's, I feel like, in my experience, it's kind of like what I'm doing right now with my spiritual walk. We're preparing for the second coming of Jesus. We know it's not going to be easy during the time of trouble. What am I doing to get ready for that? Am I just taking a nice little leisurely five-mile walk home? Or am I training like I'm, I'm getting ready for something that's going to be a 50-mile walk through the rugged mountains? We need to get ready, guys. We really do, because it's not, it's not going to be a joke when the time of trouble comes. It's going to be serious, and we're going to wish that we use this time more wisely. Okay, group number four. You read Matthew 25, verses 14 through 29. Do I have a volunteer? Brother Capa, give us a little summary for us. We are basically reading um, the parable of the talent. It's, uh, if we just summarize it, basically Jesus gave a job to his servant to share the gospel so that people will be saved to the kingdom of God also. And I learned that, you know, this kind of work, it's a, it's a privilege. Because God gave us a job just so that, you know, I, I know myself, I don't like working in a, sometime in a cafeteria, you know, just, just because it's just too much for me. And I'm complaining sometimes, you know. And, of course, everybody don't like to work. But, you know, God, if you think about creation, God gave Adam a job so that he can find joy in his labor, in his work. And this job that God gave it to us, I feel like we should think of it in a positive way, you know. Like a canvas, when we, when we go canvas and do the labor for God, we actually find joy in there because lives are changing. So yeah, that's what stood out to me in there. So you did the parable of the talents. Does anyone else in uh, your group want to share something that was important to them in that section? Uh, yes, uh, Sharon. God gives us talents, but he doesn't want us to just be satisfied with what he gives us. He wants us to um, do whatever we can to increase our talents. So, he want, so, yeah, he doesn't want us to be complacent. You know, the rest of eternity is going to show how faithful that we were here with the talents that God gave us now. And what we do to earn more talents for the Lord now, it's going to, it's going to show in heaven for the rest of eternity. I mean, if we, ha if we earn two talents for the Lord here, we're probably going to have, I don't know, level two in heaven. I don't know what I, I'm trying to explain. It's hard for me to explain what's in my mind. But uh, if we earn five talents for the Lord here, we're going to experience so much more joy in heaven because of what we did here. That's an amazing thought. We can do so much here. Like, the investment that we are putting into this world right now is going to give us dividends that are going to be so much greater throughout the rest of eternity. Just think about that. Do all you can here and now because it is going to show for the rest of eternity. It's going to pay you back for the rest of eternity. So don't be shy. Do all you can for the Lord. While you guys were reading, I was... Um, reading Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And this, uh, I'll give you a little summary of what I read. It was about when God came back, and there were two groups of people on the earth. And one group of people, Jesus said, come into my kingdom. When I was hungry, you, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, when? When did we visit you? And Jesus said, if you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And then he says to another group of people, 
You did not visit me. You did not feed me. When I was thirsty, you did not give me water. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. When I was in prison, you did not visit me. You are going to be cast into outer darkness. And they said, Lord, when did we not visit you? And he said, if you did not visit one of the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it unto me. And that, that's just what's important to me about in this chapter. It shows that our faith needs to work. If we really love Jesus... You know, if we saw Jesus literally starving to death outside of our gates, we would feed him. Did you know that a common person out there on the streets that we see, Jesus identifies himself with that person. And if we feed him or give him a little money to survive or whatever, whatever we do to help him, Jesus himself says, thank you for feeding me. That is so awesome. You know, we, we have so many opportunities to serve Jesus here in this world. Take every opportunity you can. You know, every time I pass by a guy and I don't give him money, I feel bad. I'm like, man, I could have served Jesus right now, and I didn't. I hate it when I do that. Take every opportunity you can, guys. Yes, Jace. Hello? Okay. So, yeah, what you were saying, and I think it's oftentimes that we might give people words of encouragement, but we don't do anything practical for them. And in James chapter 2, 15 and 16, it reads, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? And the same way, we oftentimes, you know, we'll pray for people and we'll, we'll pour our hearts out to God in prayer for a person, but we don't do anything about it. We, we just let them suffer there whenever we have the means to relieve their needs. And so, yeah, that's just one thing I've noticed, too. As far as possible, we need to help to be the answer to our own prayer. Like you said, if we're praying for someone, oh, Lord, please help provide for this person. If you got some extra money, help provide for him, too. You might be the answer to your very own prayer. We're going to go to Tuesday's lesson. There's a beautiful question here that I, I would like to hear. Yes, Doc. Okay, very well. Never mind. We are done. Thank you for all your comments. I appreciate you. We're going to close with a word of prayer. If you could bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to ask, first of all, we want to thank you so much for all that you have done for us, Lord. We are so blessed to be living here in America, and you've just given us everything we could ever ask for. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be your hands and feet here. You'll help us to share your love with other people and to relieve the suffering that you feel in the poor and the hungry here in this world. And Lord, please get us ready for your second coming. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.